Chapter 4. We resumed our work next morning with renewed zest, having banished all fear from our thoughts. On the morning of the second day we were working on some of the figures carved in the rock of the canyon wall. Suddenly our attention was drawn to the village sentry whose position was across the canyon at a greater elevation, affording a much wider outlook. Through our field glasses we saw him signal the village. Soon the villagers were hurrying to and fro evidently seeking protection in the great gorges deeper in the mountain fastness. All the inhabitants were deeply agitated. As we listened we could hear the low thundering roar of the advancing horde. One of our party climbed to a higher position which gave a broader view of the situation. He called back, stating that he could see the cloud of dust raised by the horsemen as they advanced toward the entrance of the canyon. We secreted our equipment in a nearby crevasse, joined our associate and found shelter in the surrounding crags and rocks where we could observe the movements of the band. As they entered the canyon, the band halted, 50 horsemen rode forward as an advance guard, then the whole band moved up the canyon, spurring and lashing their horses into a wild gallop. The clatter and roar of the hoofs over the rocky floor, coupled with shouts of defiance, caused an indescribable din. Had it not been so tragic at the time, it would have been awe-inspiring to witness this great body of horsemen sweeping forward. Our position was very advantageous, as the canyon walls were nearly precipitous so that we could look directly down upon the bandit horde as they swept on with the seemingly irresistible force of a great tidal wave. The advance band of intruders had swept past our position and those in the lead of the main band were fast approaching. We had turned our field glasses on the little village for the moment and observed that it was panic-stricken. One member of our party working on the ledge, stopped work and was watching the advancing band. We saw him turn and look through the door leading to the entrance of the center room of the temple. Our field glasses were all centered upon the figure of Jesus as he advanced through the door and stepped upon the ledge, walking directly to the brink and standing for a moment with body magnificently poised. This ledge was about 800 feet above where we were concealed and nearly three miles distant. Instantly we realized that he was speaking, and, in another moment, the words came to us clear and distinct. Our associate on the ledge sat down and began taking notes in shorthand, which I did also. Later comparison showed that we heard his words distinctly above the din of the advancing hordes. We were told that he did not raise his voice above his natural well-modulated tones. As Jesus began speaking, a perfect calm came over the entire village and its inhabitants. These are his words, translated into English by Jesus himself. My most fervent prayer will always be that I shall never forget them, though I live to be 10,000 years. The light, as I stand alone in your great silence, God my Father, in the midst of me there blazes a pure light and it fills every atom of my whole being with its great radiance. Life, love, strength, purity, beauty, perfection, stand forth in all dominion within me. As I gaze into the very heart of this light, I see another light, liquid, soft, golden white and radiantly luminous, absorbing, mothering and giving forth the caressing fire of the greater light. Now I know that I am God and one with God's whole universe. I whisper to God my Father and I am undisturbed. Still in the silence, yet in this complete silence there exists God's greatest activity. Again, I am undisturbed and complete silence is all about me. Now the radiance of this light spreads to God's vast universe and everywhere I know there is God's conscious life. Again, I say fearlessly, I am God, I am silent and unafraid. I lift the Christ high within me and sing God's praise. In the tones of my music inspiration hums. Louder and louder within me the Great Mother sings of new life. Louder and clearer with each new day, inspiration is lifting my conscious thought until it is attuned to God's rhythm. Again, I lift the Christ high and give close ear that I may hear the glad music. My keynote is harmony and the theme of my song is God and God seals my song as truth. Behold I am born anew, a Christ is here, I am free with the great light of your spirit, God my Father, your seal is placed upon my forehead. I accept. I hold your light high, God my Father. Again, I accept. As Jesus ceased speaking, a dazzling ray of pure white light shot out from the center of the solar part of his body. This beam of light extended down the canyon some distance to where the gorge made an abrupt left turn, just ahead of the place where the advanced group of horsemen were riding. 
At the point where this light beam terminated, a great barrier like a stone wall seemed to rise instantly, and great darts that appeared like flaming arrows shot out from this barrier. The advancing horses stopped so suddenly in their mad forward dash that they unseated a number of their riders. Many of them paused for a moment with their heads and forefeet in the air, then turned and bolted down the canyon completely out of control. When they reached the advance ranks of the main band, those riders that had not been unseated attempted to control their horses but to no avail. These, as well as the riderless horses, plunged on and into the front ranks of the moving band. Here the movements of the front ranks were checked, while the ranks in the rear, not realizing their danger, came on and surged over those in advance, until the canyon below us was a seething mass of men and horses. For an instant all was a dead calm save for the wild screams of frightened men and mad horses, where the wild stampede of the advance riders had clashed with the forward columns of the main band. There, a terrific scene was taking place. The riderless horses, entirely free from restraining hands, had plunged headlong into and over the advanced ranks, unseating many more men, and they with their ungoverned mounts, added to the confusion. The horses began rearing, plunging and screaming, as only dumb animals can, in a moment of uncontrolled and violent fright. This mad melee was communicated through the massed horde in the canyon below us. Suddenly we saw men draw their short swords and slash wildly in every direction, others drew their firearms and began shooting at men and horses in an attempt to clear the way for an escape. It soon developed into a battle of the survival of the fit. It ended in a mad dash for liberty by those who were fortunate enough to escape the shambles, leaving the gorge cluttered with great heaps of dead and wounded men and horses. We hurried down to give what aid we could to the wounded. All of the inhabitants and our friends joined us. Messengers were sent out far and wide for assistance. We worked feverishly through the night until after sunup the next morning. As rapidly as we were able to extricate the wounded ones from the terrible debris, Jesus and our friends would take them in hand. When the last man was cared for, we returned to the lodge for breakfast. Much to our surprise, as we entered, we found the black bandit talking to Emil. It was the first time that any of us were conscious that Emil had been present. He saw our look of wonderment and said, that will keep until later. After the meal was finished, we walked outside with the chief and he told us that Emil and himself had come upon the man seriously wounded and unable to move, as he was held down by his fallen horse. They had freed him and carried him to the temporary shelter where he was made as comfortable as possible, then they had called our hostess and turned him over to her care. After his wounds were dressed, he asked if she would ask her God to show him what to do to be like her. He also asked her to teach him how to pray. She asked him if he wished to be whole and well and he replied, yes, holy like you. She answered, now that you have asked for wholeness, your prayer is answered, you are completely whole now. The man lapsed into a deep slumber. At midnight when our chief made his rounds, he found that the wounds had completely closed and there was not a scar left. The man arose, dressed and volunteered to assist in the rescue work. We also saw a great number that we thought were just slipping into the great shadow, restored completely. Some would cringe in terror at the approach of our friends, so much so, that it became necessary to separate them from the others. After the rescue work was finished, the black one, as we called him, went about among his wounded associates, doing all he could to alleviate their fears. Many seemed like animals caught in a trap, fearing that a terrible death by torture awaited them, as that was the sentence meted out to them through the law of that land, should a bandit be captured. So definitely had this belief become fixed in their minds that they never responded to the kindness bestowed upon them. They feared they were being nurtured back to health so that the torture would be of greater duration. All were finally healed of their wounds, although a few lingered for months, evidently thinking they were delaying the day of torture. The Black One later organized all of the wounded who would join him into a protective unit against further raids and also induced many of the inhabitants to join this unit. From that time on, we were later informed, the bandit groups never again attempted to raid that district. Later two of our expeditions passed through that territory on their way to the Gobi. This man with his followers conducted them safely through his own district and the adjoining district, a distance of over 400 miles, and neither he nor his followers would accept any compensation for that service. We have been told many times that he has become a great power for good throughout the district, giving his entire life freely to the people without remuneration.
Chapter 5. By noon of the second day, the wounded had all been cared for and we made a last survey to make sure that there were no more wounded alive among the debris. On our way to the lodge for lunch and much needed rest, one of the party voiced the thought which had been uppermost for hours in all our minds, why this terrible holocaust, this destruction of life? We were tired to the very marrow of our bones and were completely floored by the shock. The brunt of the rescue work, especially in the early hours, had fallen to our lot, as the inhabitants had stood in such mortal terror of these bandits that it was very difficult to persuade them to lend assistance even after we had freed many from the entangled horses. The villagers could see no reason why they should assist in saving the lives of those who were attempting to take their lives. Many of them have a deep aversion to touching any dead thing. Had it not been for our friends, the inhabitants would have left the scene immediately, never to have returned. As it was, we were weary and heartsick, having undergone the most terrible experience of our whole lives. We arrived at the lodge, refreshed ourselves and sat down at the table completely unnerved. Shortly the food began to appear. We were all alone, our chief having accompanied one or two of our friends and Lin Chu, the black one, on a trip down the valley. After the meal we retired to our rooms to rest and none of the party awoke till late the next afternoon. While we were dressing, it was suggested that we go directly to our sanctuary, as we called the upper room of the temple. We left the lodge and started to walk to the temple as had been the custom on previous occasions. We had proceeded to the ladder that led to the entrance of the tunnel, when the one who was in advance stopped, with one foot on the first rung, and said, what has come over us? Just a day or two ago we were in the seventh heaven of delight, going from place to place at will and accomplishing things in three months that we had expected would take years to finish. Our food appears on the table, and all of this without the least exertion on our part. Now, suddenly, we have slumped back into our old habits. I want to know why this sudden slump? I can see only one thing. Every one of us has taken upon himself the condition of the experience through which we have passed. This is what is now hampering us and I for one am through with that thing, it is no part of me whatsoever. It is not mine only as I worship it and hold to it and do not let it go. I step forth out of this condition into a higher and better condition and let go. I am entirely through with it. As we stood and stared at him, we realized he was gone, he had disappeared. We were nonplussed for the moment as we saw this man attain, yet none of us would let go of that which was holding us back, though knowing full well that we were still holding on to a condition that did not concern us in the least. Consequently, we were obliged to climb the ladder, go through the tunnel, then up through the different rooms to reach our objective. When we arrived, we found our associate already there. As we were talking of the accomplishment, Jesus, the other friends, and our chief appeared. They walked into the room through the door that opened onto the ledge. We sat down and Jesus began by saying, There are so many declaring that they are the sons of God and that they have all that the Father has. They do have all the Father has, but this statement has not been made a fact until they have the courage to take the next step and see themselves as God, one with all that God is, then they do accomplish. When the one in mortal limited thought sees the Christ stand forth, that finer individuality does radiate light. That one that is projecting the Christ to see with a finer, clearer, and more extended vision. That one sees the higher body of himself vibrating at a higher rate than does his limited body that he also sees. He thinks that these are two bodies. He also thinks that that body is the Christ of another. These which appear too are only an appearance, because he does not believe that he is the Christ. Let this one declare himself the Christ and actually accept it as a fact, that instant, these two merge and that one has brought forth the Christ. Then the Christ stands forth triumphant. Now let him go one step further and declare that the Christ of God stands forth and that instant he is the Christ of God. Now the Son of God is one with God the Father and he does go directly to the Father. That one must go one more step. This is the greatest and takes the greatest determination, as every fear of mortal thought and limitation must be erased, he must step forth, go forth direct to God the Source, or the Father, and declare definitely and know positively without fear of precedent or superstition, or man-made belief, that he is God, that he is merged wholly or amalgamated with God, that he is this love, wisdom, understanding, that he is substance, that he is every attribute of God the Father, the Source, the Principle, he must accept this in all humility, such as one does show forth God. 
When you say, God, see yourself as God. See God standing forth as you stand forth. God cannot be a bigot or a boaster or an egotist. Neither can the Christ, the God-man, the image and likeness of God, be any of these things. You can be just God and so is God-man. I am as in the Father and the Father as in me, are true words. I am and my Father are one in all meekness and almighty greatness. God and all mankind united are almighty, the almightiness of God. That which was born in your so-called iniquitous thought is raised in glory because the thought of iniquity is erased. That which has borne the image of the earthly must and does bear the divine image when you raise up that ideal image. I say to you that now, this instant, is the great opportunity for you to step forth, out of this outer turmoil, into the great peace and blessings of God, and clothe yourself with the light of God. In all meekness, place the crown of Christ upon your head and, unless you yourself do this, no other can place it there for you. Step up to and be a part of the great white throne, the source. Become one with those that have made the great accomplishment in like manner, be not only one with God but be God, actually God. Then you can and do present the divine attributes to the whole world. How can God energy get into expression except through man? There is not another organism upon the whole earth that can vibrate at the same rate or frequency, and in consequence, it is so highly organized that it does perceive, then generate and transform this supreme energy, which enables man to express God to the whole world. How can this be done except through the highly organized and perfected body which are when you are in full control of that body? That control means full and complete mastership, messiahship, discipleship. You are only in control of and in perfect harmony with this body when you stand forth in perfect dominion and mastery in all the attributes of the Holy Trinity. The I am man, the Christ, the Christ of God, then combining these three with the highest, God, you are God. This is you, the man of today, all humanity, extending your vision and perceiving the truth about yourselves, that there is a higher and better life for you than the round of mundane experiences. This you perceive as you follow the right used, righteous path, in harmony and true accord, with the highest ideals you can present, or look forward to or set forth in love, reverence, and worship. The first step, you, man, become the Christ man, the only begotten Son of God. The next step, you become the Christ of God by seeing the Christ man, the Christ of God. You have joined the Christ man to the Christ of God, then, in order to go direct to the source, you must take these one, God the Father. You have now brought together the I am man into the Christ man, then you have transformed this Christ man into the Christ of God, or the Lord God. Then, through your next step, you have transformed the Christ of God into the ever-living God. These which seemed to have become one God. God, the Father of all. There is not one thing that will be impossible to you if you do not deviate from this path of right useness. In this you must be absolutely fearless and true, regardless of what the whole world may think. In standing forth and acknowledging your dominion and at one meant, you are at one with the Father, the outpouring and ever-present supreme principle of all things. With this light does not your Bible present a great allegorical depiction of man's spiritual development and attainment when rightly understood or righteously used? The shaft of light that is pictured as coming to me from heaven, is projected outwardly from my body. It is true that this light is from heaven, as heaven is all about us and as light vibration. The actual focal center or starting point of heaven must be right within my body. Therefore, this heavenly light must come forth from me. The I am of me must allow this light essence to come in, then I must generate and transform this light energy so that it can be sent out with any density that God, the I am, desires. When this is done, nothing can resist the power of this pure light. These are the beams or rays of light that you see emanating from my body when the artist portrayed me at Gethsemane. The beams of light went out from my body instead of coming out of heaven to me. Just so can you transform God power and send it out with such force that it is irresistible. It is the God power, which is recognized all about you, allowed to come in, be generated and transformed within your body, then sent out through the reflector. These things are readily accomplished by all when they stand forth as God, their divine heritage, the Christ of God, all one. This is the divine and definite motto for all humanity. The closer humanity draws to this great healing ray, the earlier will discord and inharmony be erased.
If you live freely in this light vibration which is the light of the whole world, and all draw near to it, the closer you will draw to man's true abiding place. Thus you find that I am as the light of the whole world. Behold God, the table is spread. Lift up this mighty one of God, this I am. Lift this body to God and you and all are crowned Lord of all. You do place the crown upon your own head. None can do this for you. Chapter 6. My only apology for dwelling in detail upon the experiences of these few days in regard to the bandits is to portray as conclusively as possible the power of one man clothed completely in his divine right of dominion and mastery, to turn the energy and zeal exerted and sent out by a great lawless horde to the complete protection of himself and the whole district. This protection was not only afforded but the energy and zeal released by the horde was so great that when it was magnified, energized, and returned, it caused those that would destroy to turn upon and destroy themselves. It also afforded complete protection to the whole countryside for many miles around, although the inhabitants were outnumbered by the bandits at least three to one and they had no visible weapons of defense. As soon as the excitement and the shock of the previous days had abated, we returned to our work with renewed interest. The Easter season was fast approaching and we wished to complete our work in this locality in order to return to India. From this time on our work drew rapidly to a close. The last details preparatory to the return were completed the day before Easter. We looked forward to Easter Sunday as a day of complete rest and relaxation. On our way to the temple, long before dawn, we found Chander Sen seated in the garden. He arose to accompany us, saying that our chief would meet us in the sanctuary. He suggested that we return to India by way of Lhasa, thence to Muktinath through the Trans-Himalaya Pass to Kandarnath, thence to Darjeeling. As we reached the foot of the ladder which led to the temple entrance, we halted for a moment to view the approaching dawn. Chander Sen placed one hand upon the ladder and stood as though about to ascend to the tunnel entrance. In this attitude he began talking, light does not comprehend darkness, as it shines through darkness. When Jesus saw that he was to be betrayed by Judas, he said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. The mastermind did not say, Judas betrayed me, he did not refer to Judas at all. He understood and held only to the allness of the glorified Christ of God flowing through himself. Thus we see that perfect mutual action works out all in harmony in its own way. Now you can say, Christ, stand forth more and more definitely, so definite that you are myself. In fact, now are we one body, one mind, one spirit, one whole, complete principle. You are I am, I am, together we are God. The moment he ceased speaking we were in our sanctuary, the center room of the Tau Cross Temple. We had scarcely composed ourselves when Jesus and a number of others, including our chief, entered the door that communicated with the ledge. As they entered, a great burst of light filled the room. Greetings were exchanged and we were introduced to the stranger who entered with them. He appeared to be an elderly man, yet very vital. We were told that he was one of the munis who had charge of the caves near Hastinapur. He was returning to that district and would accompany us. He had known the great Rishi Vegas and also had met Rishi Agastya whose hermitage is located in that most lovely yet secluded spot. We were overjoyed at our good fortune. We formed a circle and, placing both hands, palms down, upon the table, stood in deep silence for a few moments. Although there was not a word uttered, the room was completely filled with a strange, pulsing, vibrating emanation. It was an entirely different sensation from anything we had ever experienced and at first seemed to overwhelm us. The rocks pulsated and vibrated with a resonant musical tone. This lasted only a few moments. When the stillness was broken we were told that this morning we would see the creation of the universe in pictures. These pictures would be a representation of that which happened when our universe came into existence. We stepped through the door, out upon the ledge, and walked to the edge. It was still an hour before sunrise. The dead calm of the absolute silence enshrouded us. The time was propitious for the unfolding of another birth. We were looking out and out into infinite space, our souls eager and expectant. The Muni began by saying, there are but two events in the world, that which was in existence before consciousness began to assert itself, is now, and ever shall be, and the things that humanity has thought and will think about. 
that which was before consciousness began, is eternal, that which humanity thinks is changeable and inconstant, that which was, before consciousness began, is truth, that which humanity thinks is truth, is truth to them. When the law of truth comes to consciousness, it will erase all that humanity has ever thought erroneously. As the centuries roll on and push back the material veil by the process of evolution, thoughts come through the mind of humanity that revert back to truth or, as we call it, the original cosmic fact, and these thoughts that fill the memory of the past, faced with the facts of the present and overshadowed by prophecies of the future, stand out definitely upon the path of the whole evolving race consciousness. Thus the race is called back again and again to the original existing principle. By this return and repetition, humanity is shown that creation is eternal, the same with all mankind, but mankind's creatures are always changing and they are under a manifestation of law called action and reaction. When human beings have gone far enough in their creation of creatures, the great absolute law of truth takes a hand in bringing them face to face with the original plan. Thus we see that cosmic law never allows life to run too far in a tangent. This law is always polarized in equalization, balance, and harmony. In spite of idols or creeds it will crowd mankind on into complete union with absolute realities. All things that are not in perfect accord and union with actual, existing cosmic fact, must erase themselves when the absolute law of truth holds sway in the human consciousness. The thoughts of humanity are always so formed as to release their imperfect creations, that are only born of half-truths, when truth arrives. Cosmic absolute law must be fully satisfied. Thinking, speaking, or acting the law of reality is bound eventually to lead humanity into law or reality itself. The ancients tell us that every tree that the Heavenly Father has not planted within you, will be uprooted. Let them alone, blind leaders of the blind. If the blind always lead the blind, shall they not fall into the same ditch? The cycle is fast closing in which the blind of the whole race have led the blind into a welter of ignorance, superstition, and delusion created by those who believe as human beings think, rather than that which is true and real. The civilization that has risen on the delusions and superstitions of the closing centuries is submerging itself in the welter. Through the pain and tragedy of their misappropriated creations, a new race consciousness has been conceived and is fast evolving. In fact, the door is opening wide for its new birth. There is no other course than to go on from one plane of consciousness to a higher and more advanced step in the actual cosmic path. The only condition forbidden in the vibration of the great cosmos is that quality of thought which allows the human race to become so solidly fixed in what it believes that, if it clings desperately to its old delusions and will not let go, it can in no way come into the greater expanse of universal thought. Those thus absorbed in personal consciousness must go on through natural exhaustion of beliefs and experiences until they fail to go forward, then, of its own accord, absolute law wields a progressive hand through disease, pain, and loss, until the human is satisfied and turns to find the curse of a false idea within the idea itself. If a race or nation refuses to let go of things created by a portion of human thought instead of that which really exists, the law takes a hand in its progress by allowing the accumulated vibrations sent out by such a condition to reflect back upon itself through the light ray. Then with war, strife, discord, and death on every hand, that race or nation is wiped out, in order that it may be placed again in a new uplift of creation. Thus it can begin over again in a new contact with that which was before the beginning of human consciousness. Civilization today is fast approaching a great reconstructive moment. All things that seem so stable and well-founded now will soon be immersed in a state of inversion. Every tree that has not been planted by truth will be uprooted. There is approaching a complete cosmic overthrow of the present social, political, financial, and religious institutions that will make room for the placing of the new era in order that humanity may come in closer touch with that which as and was established before the present human consciousness submerged and set it aside. Truth waits on with attentive, loving, and radiant beneficence until man will see that he can embrace and become the consciousness of that which has always existed. Humanity is taking a forward step from the cradle stories of the former generation and their creations are no longer of any avail to the arisen individuality and spiritual discernment of the consciousness of the generation that is fast approaching. Delusions, traditions, and superstitions are nearing the end. It is also true of the civilization which they established. The old idols are good enough for the infantile consciousness that is nearing an impasse. 
Their delusion has caused their undoing as they are proved to be only cradle stories woven by a master craft of priesthood and preceptor to lull into false sleep the crying infants of an evolving race. Those who saw further afield did not cry and thus were not lulled to sleep. Most of them saw that the cradle stories were not true and many stepped boldly forth to erase the untruth, as they saw directly through to the absolute, that which has always existed and which has always been seen and known the contacted directly by a portion of mankind. From this portion there will arise a new and more vitalizing consciousness, fully awake and ready to erase the idols that man has set up for his fellow man to follow and make room for the new ideals which are as old as creation's dawn. These will demand of those who teach, lead, or inspire the race consciousness, that they shall do it from a plane of actual living contact, so high that there can be no mistake or contradiction and on a plane of interpretation that is so simple that it cannot be misunderstood. The awakening tiger of higher intelligence and spirituality will refuse to sleep again, as it is already ravaged with the fragments of the past and disappointed with the torture of misplaced confidence. It will demand a stronger and more vital thought with instruction based upon truth itself. The multitudes are now listening, over the heads of past centuries with their creed-bound traditions, to the old, old message that to the newly born is working its unfoldment into the hearts and lives of mankind. This new old message is the clarion call that is heard above the changing voices of creed-bound priesthood. It is louder than the voice of battle, it is louder and clearer than the muffled contradictions of financial, industrial, political, and religious lies. In spite of the creed-bound thoughts of a portion of humanity, their traditional and idolized ideas of God, of Christ and man, of self, of life and death, all must go, and in the absolute freedom from these preconceived ideas there must pass and thus be erased all that was built upon them. There is looming upon the horizon of this new approach a redemption that has an entirely new meaning. This new multitude, coming out of this clearer vision and more definite perception, is redeemed through deeper revelation emanating out of all races and all people. That emanation is the one life that is in all and through all. In spite of the delusion-bound multitude, their clinging hands and cringing attitude, a greater and more noble vista of the expanding horizon of God, the Christ of man, the Christ of God, of self, and death itself, is looming, and another cycle of spirit is dawning for the whole world. Another age of the crystal race is coming up out of the maelstrom. Whenever a people or nation think of God as absolute, that people or nation is God, for God is established unto them. As they love, worship, and reverence that ideal, they do become God. In the fullness of time they have reached their heritage, that which was first and is established in spirit. Whenever an individual thinks of God, he is God, God is established unto him. Breathe life into humanity, it means the same, God. In this greater understanding of cosmic revelation, men find God the same as God was before human consciousness began to manifest, the same yesterday, today, and forever. There is slowly rising from the ashes of orthodoxy the actual temple not made by hands, eternal in heaven, in man. A great new race of thinkers is coming to the fore with Herculean strides. Soon the tides will surge over the earth to sweep away the debris of delusion which has been strewn over the paths of those who are struggling along under the load of evolution. The work is already accomplished. Hundreds of millions are re-released with their heart, soul, body, and instinct free. They are the throbbing pulse of an unborn race that is again heir to the ages. I see them stepping across the ages, walking hand in hand with God. Great waves of wisdom flood toward them from the eternal shores of the infinite. They dare to step forth and declare themselves a part of eternal God, eternal Christ, God and man one eternally with eternal life. They dare to step forth and declare to heaven that much that is written by man is a lie and in terrible blindness wrought. This new pulse consciousness is the crest of the wave that rests on the new race consciousness. This new race sees man, himself, the highest expression on this planet, and one with God through the medium of his life, and it sees that his whole supply flows through that life itself. This race knows that man can live consciously in a perfect universe with perfect people and in perfect accord with perfect situations and conditions, with absolute assurance that there is not an error in the great spiritual plan of the cosmos. Man sees God as cosmic spirit pervading everything, then, with the subtleties of mind through his thought, he does not hesitate to review the fundamentals that have placed him where he is and made him that which he is. Thus he is again one with his sources. 
He knows that this source is the ever-silent side of his God-mind linked consciously in thought and amalgamated with infinite mind. This new race understands that, through sun and shadow, without the bitterness, the soul's true quest for love and true peace is the truth of God and man. This race does not hesitate to strip the swaddling clothes of delusion from the whole human race. The gaunt specter which for ages has bound the feet of the weak and doubting ego man, through his own ignorance, will be completely erased. He finds he has erased his every limitation through his true selfhood, completely arisen. He has raised himself from man, to God-man, to God.